Hello and welcome to One on One. I am Bright Nakwesi Aminin and on the show today I'll be speaking with a very interesting guest. I want to find out why he's been quiet and where he's been. Join us on the show, don't go anywhere. Stay with us. So I intentionally penned down the intro I want to do for my guest here today on the show. And so my guest on the show today is the Chief Executive Officer of A Transact. He appears to be a big data enthusiast and also tech as well. A former fintech CEO and mission head of Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council and also a former actor. This is the part I'm interested about. John Obin is my guest. Ladies and gentlemen, Junior, formerly of Homestead is my guest here on the show. Welcome. I, li I like that big smile on your face <laughs> when I mention Home Sweet Home. Memories, huh? It has lots of good memories. Yeah. Tell me about these memories. What was it? I think for me, Home Sweet Home was uh, a training ground. Um, I got to build relationships um, with the, the, the great late Kojo Datsin, um, people like Rama Brew, um, the late Kofi Bakna, you know, had really, really amazing mentors, um, people who had lived mm. um, that we as younger people could really learn from. And it was, a, it was one of the greatest training experiences for me because I came in by accident. By uh, accident? By accident, yeah. I, I was not within the field of entertainment or, or arts. I'd, I just had that type of experience within the school setting, in boarding school in the United Kingdom. Mm. Um, where I did lots of stage plays, you know, your Hamlet and Macbeth and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it was something that was not on my radar. Um, I was working within the financial world um, and um, my brother, Emmanuel Lapierre, who, was the, who is the creator of Home Sweet Home, mm. um, he had just finished Taxi Driver, which he co-created as well. And he called me and he said, you know what, I have um, about a month to go before I shoot my new TV series, Home Sweet Home, mm. which you know quite a bit about. But the main guy that I wanted to play the role of Junior, he's, he's got cold feet. He said he doesn't want to do it because he's seen the script and Junior is a bad boy, <laughs> bad character. <laughs> and he was scared that he'd be typecast, you know, that people would think he's a womanizer, he's naughty, that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. this was around 2003. You know, so we had that thing where we couldn't separate the person from the character they are playing. Exactly. So the guy chicken out. So Emmanuel called me and says, John, all I need you for is seven episodes. I'm going to shoot seven episodes over one month, pre-recorded. Um, and I just, you know the lines like no other, anyone else because you've seen the script. Mm. You've acted it out, you know, and... Yes, Junior is a little bit like you. Is, uh, <laughs> the good parts oh, are based on you. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, um, the moment he told you that, or he asked you to play the, the role of Junior, I mean, yeah. what went through your mind? Is it because you thought your friend thought you were Junior in person? No, the good side of Junior was me. The, the good side? The bad side was my brother. <laughs> so it was, it was quite easy. Mm. No, I, I, I think one thing that... Home Sweet Home really um, was good at was the fact that, first of all, it was dealing with the family setting. And wherever you are, whether you're rich or poor or in the middle, you're part of a family. So already a lot of people could identify with it. But up to today, I have young people, old people, sometimes if I'm driving in traffic or if I'm in town or wherever, come they're like, hey, I remember when you did this. They're actually quoting lines because I think I reminded everyone mm. of that young teenager who is trying to impress girls, you know, trying to do their best to earn a living at that age, you know, um, to, uh, and that's, we all have that entrepreneurial stuff growing up, exactly. you know, where you're realizing that, you know, you need to make something of yourself. You can't just always wait for handouts, you know, so some of our naughty friends used to sell parts from their dad's cars, go and sell it come with the money and go and spread their friends, you know? So I think a lot of people could really identify with my character. I think I really tapped into that zeitgeist of that generation where mm. they were like, ah, I represent everyone. Yeah, you, you did. Because you know. as a now, 
uh, forgive me if I yeah. end up calling you Junior along no, no, the no, line because that's, that's I still, I still, I still want to call you Junior. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> but then it was so the setup was so family oriented that for a time I, I, I thought there was a real family who were living their real lives through the screens. You know, it, it was almost like a reality TV show, sort of very, very interesting. But then I want to find out what exactly make you want to stop acting in the first place. Well, just in the same way I think uh, I got in was the same way I got out. It, it's, as I said, I came to Ghana to shoot the seven. But after I shot the seven, I had about two weeks before I went back. And then it hit the screens. And I saw the way the public loved it. Overnight, I became a celebrity. You know, at first, when I used to go to Frankie's, I'll be waiting in line now. Mm -hmm. When I go to Frankie's, they serve me first, you know. <laughs> the I realize, the exactly, I realize when I go to uh, clubs, you know, I'm letting through the side, you know. And so I realized I was getting this different type of treatment, which I was not getting from, from Canada, where mm. I was at that point, you know. So I decided to, to stay for a bit longer. But I think, coming back to your question, what made me... If you realize, if you've watched Home Sweet Home from the beginning, mm. in the beginning, it was just about having fun and partying and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But as the episodes went, and I wrote probably about 50, 60% of the scripts that you were seeing on Home Sweet oh, Home. you did? Yes. So I was a co-writer with Emmanuel Appiah. Um, I was a co-producer with Emmanuel and Julia Appiah. And Emmanuel did most of the directing. But you realize that the storyline started to change a little bit more. And that's how it even ended up in the film we did, Run Baby Run, mm -hmm. where it talked about drugs and how it affects societies. If you realize, I started dealing with important issues on HIV, um, parental abuse, um, wife abuse, child abuse, teenage pregnancy. So I started going more into that social side. Because I think as it progressed, I realized that the pulpit that we have, you know, as performers, is not only to just make people laugh, you know. You can make people laugh, but make people think about particular issues. Those two don't have to be mutually exclusive, you know. You can do both things. You have a higher calling. Mm. So I think what made me leave is that higher calling, that I, I recognize that I want to contribute in a different way, using the skills that I have. I want to contribute in other ways, to Ghana, to Africa, to the world. I realized I could do so many other things. And I had that skill set that I'd got from what I was doing now mm. to be able to go to the next level. So I had almost forgotten that we are, we've grown. And I was expecting to, to see you walk in to the studio in a Durak. I don't, I, I, I don't know. I don't know why I thought that people way. People expect me yeah. to have stayed at the same age, but they'll grow. So, <laughs> <laughs> so people, I'll see someone who's like 30. They're like, ah, Junior. I used to watch you as a kid. What's happening now? But You're too old. Is that not a plus for you to let, to let you know that, I mean, what you were doing back then was, ref was a reflection of some, the lives some of us were living back in the days so much that we're still uh, hoping to see ourselves through you? Oh, 100%. I, I, I think it's a good thing. It's, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's definitely not a bad thing. Mm. Yeah. But then you, you've done almost every single thing. And here, my, my people, I know you've done construction on the media platform. You've worked with the Commonwealth and all. Walk me through the journey from the junior wish to watch on our screens to the corporate junior up here we know now. So when I left, um, when I left Ghana, when I left the art world, mm. um, I decided to do my master's. Um, in the United Kingdom. So I got admission to the University of Oxford um, to do a master's in public policy. And what I liked about that master's was that it was, it was based on a lot of policy evaluation and a lot of research. It was very research based. Mm. Because what I'd made up my mind, when I was in Ghana doing Home Sweet Home, I ended up getting a lot of actors from the Liberia camp the Budumbura yeah. camp. So the, the lady who played my girlfriend, um, who had my child in Home Sweet Home, um, De Conti, um, and my best friend Gaida, yeah. I discovered both of them from that Liberian camp. They are, they are all of Liberian descent. You know? But being within that group made me recognize a lot of the problems that they were having as refugees in Ghana. Yeah. You know? So it, it, they really helped me to develop home sweet home to be a bit more social conscious 
because I realized the different issues, like someone like Gaeta, if you find out his life story of, you know, being, coming from the U.S. into Liberia in the middle of the war, you know, where you're sleeping and you're hearing gunshots and all that kind of stuff, and was able to get into a car and come to Accra and stuff, it changes your mindset, you know, it changes your mindset of what is happening around us. Like, we're here in Ghana, but up in the Burkina Faso, Sahel, there's a lot of issues going around, but sometimes we're so encapsulated within our world that we don't recognize the bigger issues at play. So when I left, my main reason for doing that master's was I wanted to mm -hmm. learn more about how society interacts with politics, interacts with research. Um, and there, I think I was able to really hone my skills and use what I'd learned in the, the media mm -hmm. and entertainment space to, to really act as a launch pad for the rest of my career. And that's why I learned a lot about technology as well. Because mm. a lot of the research I did, I did a lot of systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which use statistics. Statistics and being able to see how you can manipulate technology to think for you. Mm. It's, in, it's interesting hearing you speak about um, tech and digitization the way you do. I mean, I can feel the enthusiasm in there. But then I want to find out, you worked at Commonwealth, uh, 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 which you're no more there because you're now with um, E-Transact as a CEO. Well, I, I'm, I'm still the chief of mission for the Commonwealth, but mm. it's a role that I've reduced to probably about 15%. Um, because I got into that role right after my master's, I did an internship at the Commonwealth office. And then from there, I worked for Her Majesty's office, and, and the, Queen? Society, the Queen's office. Um, well, it's a government ministry, but all the government ministries in the UK are called Her Majesty's Office for Civil Society, Her Majesty's Office for, for something of that Did sort. Did you ever meet her? Oh, many times, yeah. Great. Yeah. Many I'll, times. I'll with the, with yeah. the royal. <laughs> <laughs> many times through the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. um, because after I worked as, for, as an intern, a six-month intern in the Commonwealth office, then I moved to the Office for Civil Society, which was attached to Her Majesty's Cabinet Office. I had a senior position there, and then I moved back to the Commonwealth. Um, but this time, I moved back to the Royal Commonwealth Society. And if you Google me, you see a lot about the Royal Commonwealth Society. I did a lot. And the Royal Commonwealth Society was basically a Commonwealth organization that sits between the Royal Household of Her Majesty the Queen and the Commonwealth. Okay. So in that role, I run a lot of projects. Pro like what exactly? So I don't know if you ever heard of the Queen's Essay Competition. Yeah, I know about that. So if you heard anything about the Queen's Essay Competition, I was the one behind it in Ghana here. You know, when Prince Charles came and, um, to Ghana with his wife Camilla, you know, we had a lot of events both in Accra and Kumasi around the Queen's Essay Competition and we, my team and I organized about five or six of the events that Prince Charles and Camilla were involved in um, because the Queen is the head of the Commonwealth. Yeah. Yeah. So although the British High Commission here represents the government of the United Kingdom, <coughs> of which the Queen is the head, she's also the head of the Commonwealth. And in my role as um, head of um, Africa for the Royal Commonwealth Society, I, I had um, authority over 19 African countries. And our main remit was to promote the values of the Commonwealth um, within those 19 countries. And from there, I moved to where I am now, which is with the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council, which is the business side of the Commonwealth, which is where the money mm -hmm. is, the business side of the Commonwealth. Um, and in that role, I've been in that role for about three years. So I was in that role when the position for e-transact came up. Mm. And I had a discussion with my, my bosses within the Commonwealth that, I really love this role because it's something I'm passionate about with technology. In the background, I sit on different boards and I have different businesses that utilize a lot of technology. And so I said, I really want to, I really want to take this role, um, but I still want to keep the role as the chief of mission for the Commonwealth across Ghana, Gambia, Cameroon, Sierra Leone because I enjoy business. Mm. Yeah, what I'm doing with eTransact is all about business. It's one ecosystem, and I can really use it to drive everything I'm doing within Ghana. Great. I, I want to find out how you are able to juggle between working for the Commonwealth and still 
the CEO of New Transaction. That will be after this very quick test. Still, that's we're still live here on 101. I am Brighton Mini. We'll be back with more. So I still have a studio with me, um, John Kojo Apia. John Kojo Obin Apia, who is the CEO for e Transact here in Ghana. And if I wonder what e Transact is, it's a digital technology company and they've been in existence for about 15 years now, if I'm correct. 100%. Yeah. So that, tell that, me how you've been juggling between the Commonwealth and e Transact. Well, I think, right, for me, the most important thing is the teams that you work with. You know, it's always said that no man is an island. And I, I think a lot of the time, when you have a star player, even in football, like mm -hmm. Messi or Ronaldo, he is not the one who dictates the way the whole play does. If you don't have anyone feeding him the ball, Messi or Ronaldo are not going to score the goals. Exactly. So the most important thing for me are the teams I work with. Um, in E-Transact, I have an amazing team. Um, George Babafemi, who is the executive director, is the one next in line. He, if you see his head, you see the type of brain that he... <laughs> the type of brain that... <laughs> You know, I think actually all my tech guys have very big heads, you know. It's because they do much of the code and all of, that. A lot of processing is, is happening mm. in there, you know. Um, but, you know, I have a very strong team, you know, in e-transact. Um, and my role there is more for the macro and the strategic role. And the same of the Commonwealth. Within all these territories, I have country directors who are very competent at what they do. And my role is to be the overall head in terms of just working on strategy and seeing how we can tap into new markets. So more of the macro approach mm. is what I think I do in, in both roles. Well, I watched an interview of you in preparation to meet you here today mm. and I realized and heard how much you like to link arts to tech. What was the link there? What was the, what was the relationship between art and tech? Well, I think, you know, a lot of the time we've we've um, divorced those two disciplines. Mm. Um, but you realize that the greatest inventions always had a bit of those two involved. Like, y you look at what Elon Musk is doing or Elon Musk's background, you know. It's a background which is mixed with art and science. You know, you look at a car like the Tesla that everyone is going on on how beautiful it is. Or you look at the iPhone that people, uh, that has changed the game. There's a scientific side to it in terms of being able to perform. But there's a beauty to the phone or to the car that people mm -hmm. also love. Exactly. You know, so there's always that duality between art, art and science. And I think our education systems have usually divided it. But you realize that the most brilliant surgeons in hospitals are people who are artists. Most of them, their pastime is drawing. Yeah. Because it takes a lot of art even to do surgery. So to be able to think outside the box, I've always <coughs> been the believer of the fact that you have to meld different disciplines. You know, you look at Leonardo da Vinci yeah. and, and great innovators like that, they were able to really meld the disciplines of arts, humanity, science, all together. When you're able to do that, go across your disciplines. You know, in university, when you get a first class, it's because you've over-answered the question. Exactly. The, if and you your get attitude it, as well. 100%. If you just answer that, what is 1 plus 1, and you say just 2, that's like a 2-1 answer. But if you say 1 plus 1 is 2 for these reasons, that's what gets you to that first class. That's what gets you to change the game. And, and everything for me is about innovation. My role now of e-transact, the reason I love it so much is because we are at a point where innovation is extremely important. Great. We are in the fourth industrial revolution. And if you look at all subsequent revolutions, Africa has missed them. A lot of the time, we've missed them, but for the first time ever, we've been able to leapfrog. We've leapfrog for how many of you, or how many of us, had landline phones in our house? Mm -hmm. How many of us were using the phone boxes outside but, but some of the things at the time were almost meant for the rich and wealthy in the country you know it wasn't so open that i mean it, i mean it, do you even have the money to buy them no you understand it was meant for them but that's not how it's supposed to be all these things are supposed to be available to everyone you know when we're paying our taxes or if we're paying our taxes 
and the taxes are being used well, we're supposed to have basic services in education, in health, in infrastructure, you know, roads, street lights, all those are basic necessities mm. that we're supposed to have. You know, so in the West, they've been able to, or in the West, they were able to have those basic things that helped them to work better. It helped commerce to work better. Mm -hmm. So when people have phones in their house, for instance, you might just think, oh, it's just something that you have phones in your house. But it actually allows you to communicate with your work people, to tell them, oh, I'm coming in later. Can I do this from home? Someone calls you from work. You're like, oh, I need to do this, that, that, that. You know, if you don't have a phone at home mm. and you don't have a mobile phone back in the days, you have to travel all the way there to go and tell the person, say, oh, me, ye, we, yo, into me, into me, I'm back. You've lost time, you've lost money. All right. you know? So there's basic infrastructures, both at the micro level and at the macro level, that are supposed to, to, to aid you. Mm. And in Africa, we've leapfrogged straight to mobile telephony. And now we're the leaders. When you talk of mobile payments in the world, Africa has about 64%, 64 or 65% of all mobile payments via the phone were in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. We know how COVID-19 came in and almost everybody was screaming. I mean, we're all scared. But then this is where I want to call it the bad news, the good deeds. You know, cause, because COVID-19 came around, we're being made to work from home. We made use of our phones, our, tab our tablets, our laptops and all that. I mean, at this stage, we also have the Vice President, Dr. Mumbamia, leading the digitized I mean, I'm, I'm space and all that. Are we going too much of a top speed? And do you believe that the School of Philosophy says we are not really ready for such a, a wave? Oh no, there's, there's never, if you're going to wait to be ready, you'll be late. You know, the idea is to take the lead where you have to. And we are not ahead digitally. We are, we are playing catch up in lots of other areas. We are still not there. Oh, no, no, we're still not there. In terms of mobile phone, um, mobile internet penetration in Africa, we're 28%. The world average is about 50, 60%. So we are behind in so many different places. We are behind. Even now, you remember, you, I'm trying to locate your house mm -hmm. and you're giving me directions. You're, okay, come straight, come straight. And then you see a woman selling cocoa and then you turn left and then you see someone, a kiosk, a red kiosk. What if it's rain and the kiosk is gone? What if the woman <laughs> selling cocoa is not rain. well and she doesn't come to work? Then you can't find your place. So now with SatNav and with our address system, our digital address system, we are able to find places. You just ask that, oh, give me your digital address. I'm able to input it. I'm able to find it, you know. So digitalization is what we need if we as Ghanaians and Africans are going to compete on the international stage. We have AFTA, the AFTA Secretariat here. Mm -hmm. The AFTA Secretariat is only useful if we utilize what is providing us. It's not just about we have the AFTA Secretariat in Ghana. How are... SMEs using it? How are we fintechs being able to help SMEs to sell their goods to other African countries? That is the question. Now, uh, and what is the percentage like? Are we utilizing it well? The percentage of? Of the utilization of the AFTA to ensure that we are actually um, taking advantage of it, not just having the building or the edifice here in Ghana. Are we really making you, use of it? You know, Bright, AFTA is, a, is, is quite a complex problem. Yeah. Um, because the problems that AFTA has to, or the hurdles it has to climb over, are continental problems. And those continental problems need continental solutions. So yesterday I was at a talk at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences where the governor of the Bank of Ghana spoke. And one of the most important things is about infrastructure. The infrastructure that we have in Africa was built by the colonial powers. And their main objective of building those structures was to be able to extract gold and other precious metals. So it was just from mining sites to the ports or to the castles and then off. Their objective was not a connected Africa. If you look at the scramble for Africa that happened in Berlin, Africa was carved up in the way it was carved up to be able to divide and rule individually. So mm. the whole idea was not connectivity. But unfortunately, successive governments have come and we've not continued 
what they started. So railroads are not connected between Sierra Leone, Liberia, Ivory Coast, Ghana. Mm. So for me to travel, for instance, Bright, from Ghana to Sierra Leone, it's actually cheaper sometimes for me to go to maybe Amsterdam and come from Amsterdam now to Sierra Leone. Why? Because there's a lot of problems with uh, trade barriers like um, charges and tariffs. All those things are hurdles that the AFTA has to surmount. You know, road systems are bad. So for me to bring tomatoes from Sierra Leone to Ghana, it's cheaper for me to actually bring it from China. Mm -hmm. Because we have bad roads. We don't have enough ports. We don't have railways. So there's a lot of continental problems that a lot of the governments have been trying to face individually. But you can't deal with a regional problem at the individual level. In Ghana, the road budget per year is $1.2 billion mm. per year. But Africa as a whole, over the next 10 years, we need about $1.5 trillion to be able to fill that infrastructure gap, to make us ready to be able to trade within African countries. How's one country going to do that on its own? And how long will it even take for us to execute this? So you need a united Africa that recognizes that let's come together as governments and let's deal with regional projects together. Mm -hmm. Railways. You have Rockefeller, a private businessman, 1869. He did the railroads in America. Yeah, I was watching a documentary um, titled the men who, who built, built America. America. You Thank you so much. And you have Carnegie, and the, uh, yeah. Rockefeller, um, J.P. Morgan, Ford. Those are the titans that built America. You know? And the private sector really has to lead on those initiatives. Because, Brian, do you know the interesting thing? When the railroad roads were built, the telegraph companies now came and said, everywhere there's a railroad, we're going to put our wires. So now you had communication and transport in one. So that is how Africa's problem, we have to deal with it. You have an infrastructure deficit and then payments. How are you dealing with different, different currencies? Mm. You know, I'm paying for, Africa loses $5 billion a year. The whole thought is it if you are losing this big amount of money? It's, it's just the fact that <coughs> we are not all connected. And one of the things I spoke about yesterday at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences was on the Pan-African Payment Settlement System, called PAPS, of which eTransact is one of the processes. The founder of eTransact is on the board of Afri Exim Bank, and Afri Exim Bank are the ones who've created this PAPS. So what PAPS means is that you can buy something in Kenya, mm -hmm. and you pay for it in cities. You pay for the good in Kenya in cities, and it's shipped to you. You don't have to now say, oh, I'm going to change into dollars and send to someone or this and that or pay by visa or stuff. No. But, but so, sorry to cut you. Is that yeah. not the same initiative the ECHO was wants to um, implement or the ECHO? Similar, but the ECHO is just dealing with West <coughs> Africa. You see, as I was saying, we have a continental problem. Mm -hmm. And the continental problem, once you divide it in so many different parts, does it really become effective? You know, in Asia, for instance, like you have the um, Asian Southeast nations. They have a group called ASEAN. Yeah. But you also know about APEC. Yeah. The Asian Pacific Economic Communities. ASEAN, on its own, its GDP is $3.08 trillion. APEC, which is made up of the ASEAN countries plus another 10, guess what their GDP is? Tell me. 50.2 trillion. The important thing is that you can have a group of 11 people, but if you're able to tap into another group of an extra 10, the Asia and Pacific are side by side. If you're able to tap into two regional blocks, the compounding effect mm. is huge. I, huge. I was watching the uh, conference last year. I mean, and you can hear them talk about how they are planning on ensuring that the connectivity between them is tightened. And I'm wondering, how can we implement such a same thing here in Africa? How can we do that? Bright, I'm glad you watched The Men Who Build America because that's one of my greatest documentaries. Yeah. Um, when I watched that, my mind changed from 
being the footballer on the field to want it to makes you be, want to work it makes you want to be the owner of the football team you know because you realize that the times of going to university and come to do nine to fives are over yeah maybe do the nine to fives to get the experience but if you want to help your <coughs> continent and you want to make a difference you have to be an innovator exactly or an entrepreneur you know for me AFTA is on the right track with what they're doing the pan-african payment settlement systems which we are a very major part of is a complete game changer it opens up africa it opens up the informal sector we as fintechs are very keen on it because a fintech company like e-transact our unique selling point is that we are the ones who reach the last mile banks and other institutions don't reach the last mile they don't they can't reach the person in the village the unbanked and the underbanked we as fintechs are the ones who are able to reach them because our applications they can use on mobile phones i don't think i even have the application but then a bank with Ghana commercial bank yeah my transactions are done if you're banking as, inter as the intermediary or whatever you want to call yes. it if, if you're banking this we are each transact is connected to 23 banks in ghana and so our main business has been B2B. Mm. We help a lot of these banks and these institutions on the back end, including the one you bank with. You know, anything that has to do with their digitalization, we are the workhorses behind that, giving an efficient and robust service. Mm. And as you said, we are the first real payment system provider in Ghana. Mm. I see people yesterday when I met the governor of the Bank of Ghana and his deputy, and I was saying that everyone says we should have been a unicorn by now. And they're like, yeah, you guys, you guys were the pioneers. You guys were the first. Before anyone was talking about digital payments, I went to a, me a, a bank meeting with the executive director that I was talking about, George Babafemi. And as soon as we walked in, the guy in, in, in recognized him and said, I remember you. 15 years ago, mm. you were telling us all these things about mobile payments, etc. And we thought you were stupid. We thought you were mad, but all those things have come to pass. But you you see, a, a company like eTransact yeah. that has been working for 15 years, yeah. and you come on board from Commonwealth, the transition, how did it work for you? Well, you know, Bright is my background. Um, I think we've tapped on a little bit of my background. But, but I'll, I'll still come back to you. I mean, I wanted, to, I wanted you to take me through your educational background as well, because I'm sitting here listening to you, and I feel like I'm listening, I'm listening to some finance minister or some <laughs> a Greek minister or something. I want to find out if there is politics in there in line for you. I have a lot to ask you about. So let's, for now, just tell me about so this. So my undergraduate was in social political sciences. My master's was in public policy but with a focus on evaluation, statistics, and research, of which a very important component was technology. Mm -hmm. Then I have a postgraduate certificate from the Judge School of Business at the University mm -hmm. of Cambridge in finance and technology. So that's where my fintech comes from. Uh, but prior to eTransact, mm -hmm. I had been an investor in a tech startup, probably around 2012. So I know a lot of that market. Besides that, I've worked for top tech companies um, in the world. Um, some are famous, some are quite infamous. <laughs> you Mention know. them, I mean, because like, I want to hear where you've been, what you've been up so to. So you, you've heard of Cambridge Analytica? Yes. You've watched the film? Yeah. Okay, so I was head of Africa, or head of strategy mm. within the Africa region for Cambridge Analytica. You're a big man. No, no, no. <laughs> You're a big <laughs> man. Yeah, so Cambridge Analytica, you know, was I actually did a case study of Cambridge Analytica when I was at Oxford, and that is how I got into the role. Um, so I've worked on business businesses. We're talking of some of the biggest biggest businesses you can think of, mm. which are in Fortune 100 businesses. Mm. I've worked on data strategy and technology, and that is where I think my media and comms background as well helped, because. I think I was able to, I'm one of the few people who, my education background, educational background means I understand statistics yeah. and how data and technology works. I'm not a data scientist, but I know when the data scientist has prepared it, I know how to now mix it up with business. 
and mix it up with communication to see how do you now communicate this, stat this stats with a business? How do you understand how the human mind thinks? How do you understand how technology works? How do you add value to the lives of people? Because that's what I'm doing now in my role as eTransact. I'm there to add value to you, the consumer. Mm. But are, 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 they, are these trades mm. that you are born with, or these are trades or something you learned in school? I, I think, and that's why I think I was asked yesterday that which one do I place more emphasis on education or experience? And I said experience. Because in all honesty, Bride, a lot of the education I have is not the one I learned in school. But you've been privileged to go to some very big schools, some very big names out there. 100%. But you know, there's a difference between schooling and education. Everyone can go to school. Mm -hmm. Some people are not academic, but they can afford to go to school. But education or educating yourself is an individual thing. You know, you, as you said, on, I've traded in different commodities before. I've traded in gold. I've traded in oil. All these things, I had to learn myself first. What was the push? What was the push? I'm just a curious mind. I'm a curious mind who always just wants to get to the next level, who just wants to see how I can push myself to understand things. I, I, you know, during my master's, I had a cubicle. Mm. In the, if, if you've watched um, Harry Potter. Okay. You, 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 you know Harry Potter, the wooden library, mm -hmm. the Humphreys library. That was where I used to study when I was in Oxford. And I had a cubicle that everyone knew was mine because early in the morning, before anyone, I'm the first one in line there. And I put a Bible verse there, um, Philippians 4.13. Mm. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then I put impossible is nothing. Adidas. You, you own the place. I, I pretty much own the place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I believe you can do anything when you put your mind to it. Anything you put your mind to that you want to do, I believe you can do it. Mm. It's just about teaching yourself or seeing how you can learn, getting the right mentors, but there's nothing that is impossible for us to do. You want to go to the moon? It's possible. If you put enough effort in it, you can do it. You know, I, I didn't know who you were before you came on our screens. All I, I saw was that there's a young man who is playing the role of Junior, telling us about the young lifestyle and how, I mean, you can, you know, find your way around your daddy <laughs> <laughs> and all that. But listen to you now, there's a huge transformation. Oh, there's a huge gap between who you were on our screens and who you are now. How have you been able to deal with this? And let's say you go for meetings or go for uh, pitches and you are all tied up and you get there and you are, you are, you are, you are presenting and you go like, uh, uh, do you get that? Do they take it serious when they go out there to do your pitches and all that for meetings? I, I think it's good that I've been off the screens for a while. So people kind of like maybe forgot a little bit about it. But I think a lot of it has to do with the substance. Um, when people meet me, or they Google me, or they realize where I'm coming from. You know, like initially, when I came, because the role I do with the Commonwealth is an ambassadorial role, mm. you know, and I get into places and I'm meeting heads of state or other people, and they're like, ah, we just we have a question. When, when we Googled your name, <laughs> something <laughs> you know? else came up. Yeah, they're like, we Googled your name, but some actor has your name. He goes, do you know someone, have you reported it to Wikipedia? Someone's Report, masquerading. Huh? I say, no, no, no. That's, that's me in a parallel universe. Mm. But that's what I bring. And I think once they realize the type of portfolios you've held um, and the type of work that you've done, they, they recognize that you can't you can pigeonhole a person within a particular field. And I think I'm a, an example to lots of young people like, I used to be junior, but now I'm senior. Okay. Yeah, as, <laughs> as you see, all the waves have gone into uh, the ocean. We, we can manage yeah, that. We can manage that. We can manage that. Yeah. What about the grays? You can manage the grays? I mean, we have young men who are even, I mean, spraying the even more black. Gray. Yeah, for the gray and all that. So it's manageable. Well, at first, let me tell you a secret. Well, now that it's on TV, it's probably not a secret. Yeah, don't worry. I'm going to do But at it. first, a, a few years ago, I used to, as soon as I saw my gray, I was like, oh, God, that's like, it's like I'm going too old. <laughs> so I used to, to die. And then I was on a 
commodity um, trading gig in Nigeria, because I used to deal in crude oil. And the CEO meets me, and after we finish the meeting, mm. and they're ready to buy and all that kind of stuff, he calls me aside in the full room, boardroom, and he calls me aside and he goes, say, you know, next time you're coming, can you come with an older person? He said, the older person doesn't have to speak. They don't have to say anything. They don't need to know about oil. Yeah. Just bring the older person and say, this is your boss. Why that? B no, because How did I even affect you in the first place? Oh, I didn't care. I was, it was all about making the money at that point, you know. So if you want me to bring an old man, I'll, do I'll bring an old man. It's just that my dad was too old. He couldn't travel. <laughs> Otherwise, my father had been the one, you know. Mm. But I went back with someone who did not know anything about oil. But the person just sat there, and when the rest of the board came, they assumed that I could deliver on what I'd said I could deliver because but, I was young. But why that mentality? Why did that? Let's say the old don't believe the young can do certain things. Why that belief? Well, I think it's always, it's always been around, you know, especially within Africa. You know, there's just been that belief that if you're, if you're young, you're not um, knowledgeable enough. But I think it's up to the younger generation as well mm. to make an effort to prove the older people wrong. Because I find out that nowadays a lot of young people, they don't cross their T's and dot their I's. You know, they are, they are not meticulous. Mm. Like the old school used to be very meticulous. In the olden days, you have someone who's, they have a bachelor's, you know, they come and sit in front of you, very the critical. English, they write. But now, you have people who even have masters, they write in front of you and you're like, ah, like, where do you get your masters from, you know? The sentence is incomplete, yeah. you know, and that's why I said there's a difference between schooling and education. Me, my schooling is not what contributed to how I speak or how I write. It's my education. I educated myself from reading newspapers. Mm -hmm. Age 13, 14, I was reading The Guardians, The Independent, The Times. And whilst you're reading, it's somehow, I don't know what happens in the brain, but sentence construction, how to write, the type of vocabulary and diction to use, somehow sticks in your mind. Mm -hmm. So for any young person or for young people watching, read as much as you can. It does something that yeah, I, cannot, I cannot explain. We are out of time. But before we go, I want to do a very quick Q and A. So I'll ask you, you answer, you answer me back in sure. just less than two, two seconds. Sure, sure. Are you coming back to acting? No. Is there any politics in there? No. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a business person who loves technology. And for me, I think politics is not the only way you can contribute mm. to your society, you know. As business people, private sector people, what I'm doing with eTransact, we're adding value to people's lives. We're Great. offering solutions that make your life easier. We are, we are bringing you into the digital world. It makes it easier for you to make payments, to receive payments. <coughs> and that's what I want to do, add value to people's lives. And it doesn't have to be in a structured way. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been here with... <laughs> Forgive me, I just want to say Judy up. <laughs> I've been here with John Kojo or Ben Apia. And I realize your Apia is spelled differently. A-P-E-A, -E like different from how it's spelled A-P-P-I-A-H. Why, right, why that? that's, that's the real spelling, huh? That's the, that. that's the indigenous spelling, A P A R. The A P P I A H is the adulterated one. Adulterated. Which, which, was, which was created to make it easier for the colonial masters to pronounce Apia. So what was the white pronunciation? It's just Apia. Apia. Okay. Yeah, yeah, All right. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Brian. I'm really honored having you here on the show today. Really grateful. And so once again, my guest here, okay, he's the chief executive officer of E. Transact, he appears to be a big data and tech enthusiast, former fintech CEO and mission head at Commonwealth, which he tells me, oh, we all the other, he's still with them, okay, and also an investment council, and also a former actor, which he tells me, there's no door of return. Thank you so much for coming. I am Bryce, and this has been 1-1. Thank you for watching. Bye. <laughs>